Well, that's a great introduction and thank you all for joining. I'm delighted to be here. You'll see the title slide of this deck is that I'm on a North American book tour, actually seven cities into a 13 city tour where I've gone to many different locations. And I saw Chris and, and part of the team in um, in LA and they, they were even part of the program, which was terrific. Um, San Francisco, New York, Montreal, uh, uh, Miami and other cities so far. I also am going to be in Washington DC next Tuesday on the 24th and then in Boston on the 26th. So if you or anyone you know are in town those days it would be Really wonderful to uh, to have you. You can learn more about that at www.web3booktour.com. Um, this is a very exciting time in human history. Every once in a while, a new technology emerges that transforms the economic power grid and the old order of human affairs in ways that are, are sometimes uh, profound and sometimes kind of unexpected. And uh, we're in this moment right now where there's not one, but several new technologies all emerging at the same time, or at least are all sort of hitting their stride at the same time. The first one is blockchains. Uh, blockchains ena you know, enable individuals and businesses to uh, transact, to move and store value peer to peer, to automate complex business processes like contracting without the need for intermediaries to enforce the terms. They are in a way sort of the economic underpinning of uh, the next digital age. The second technology is AI. AI, in my view, is going to reimagine what computers can do and also what people can do when empowered with these technologies and could also create lots of societal problems and disruptions that I don't think we've fully reckoned with. Extended reality, I think, will take our two-dimensional web and turn it into a three-dimensional web or a spatial web that's integrated into our natural environment. And that becomes a new, um, you know, surface for innovation and opportunity for, for business. And then the Internet of Things. The uh, you know, notion that there will be billions or trillions of connected devices that will will be doing a lot more than you know monitoring our 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 um, you know our our health or or um, you know measuring temperatures or driving us around or you know regulating the flow of electricity. These are going to be devices that have intelligence and um, have economic agency, and I think that the combination <laughs> of those technologies is really interesting. So, in I think what's important to understand here is that these technologies are not separate but related in the same way that the term internet went from describing a narrow set of networking technologies to describing a range of technologies but also new business models and um, new social behavior and other phenomena my view is that web3 is coming to encapsulate this next digital age with these technologies at the forefront so let me start with blockchains so for 40 years 30 years however you want to look at it we've had an internet of information. When you use the internet to say to send and move information, um, you're not sending an original, you know, unique thing, an asset, um, something of value. You're sending a copy, right? So if you send an email to someone, you can send the same email to someone else. And if you attach something, then that attachment can be copied. If you post something on a website, anybody can access it. If you write something on Twitter or in any other social media platform, it's available for all to see. So in a way, the web, the first era of the internet, um, is kind of like a printing press for information. And like the first printing press was, you know, broadly a very positive and powerful thing. But when it comes to things that have value, money, assets, um, stocks and bonds, titles and deeds, votes, intellectual property, even you know, real assets in the economy, um, being able to create copies of those things is not such a great idea. So instead of sending an email, you know, you're sending someone money or you sell them a security or something, it's very important that when you send that money that you can't send the exact same money to someone else. Because if we can copy money the way we can copy information, then that money becomes worthless. So it's great to have a printing press for information, but it's not so great to have a printing press for value. And this is a very specific problem that, you know, computer scientists tried to figure out for many decades. I mean, in the 1990s, you know, Mark Andreessen wanted to ship Netscape with digital money in the browser, but they couldn't figure out this double spend problem. How do you ensure that when you send something of value, you can't send the same thing twice? And I think people are, if you're listening to this webinar, you probably know this, but 
um, you know, Bitcoin basically solved the double spend problem through the introduction of this thing called the blockchain. So blockchains are just decentralized or distributed ledgers of transactions in a network that everyone can see and everyone can trust, but no single entity can alter. And the only way that new entries can get added is if the network reaches consensus. So instead of a ledger of transactions sitting inside a powerful middleman like a bank or a big tech company, it's available for um, everyone to be able to see and to trust. And that's something that more than anything is going to help us to take a leap forward, both in the internet and the web. So the first era, I should just say that the internet and the web are slightly different things. You know, the internet was invented in the 60s as a project of the Depar Depar Department of Defense um, and remained a, something that academics and you know, government officials and others used for, for many decades. Um, the web was launched in 1989 and commercialized in the 90s with the web browser. The first era of the web, what uh, we now call the read web, but what I think a lot of people probably remember as the dot-com era, was basically a broadcast medium for the presentation of information, right? So, you know, you would go onto the web, you'd go to a website, you type in the URL, you could see text, you could read, you know, read text, you could see content, but you couldn't really interact with it. Um, you couldn't upload your own content and you weren't really using the web as a way to, you know, build community or, or um, you know, um, uh, build sort of a collective action of any kind. Um, but still, the, the web was a powerful tool um, in the sense that it democratized access to information, at least for people who had access to an internet connection. So what I mean by that is, you know, if I'm a, you know, 12 year old student in Toronto or, you know, a, a, a manager of a company in India or, you know, someone who um, works at the university in the Philippines, wherever, at the same time, we can all go to the same place to access the same information. That's something that just didn't exist before. So democratized access to information. Web two, the second era of the web, took the web forward in a pretty major way. So now the web was not just a way to consume content, it was a way to share information, um, to find community, to build community, to collaborate online. And that was because of user-generated content. Um, you know, All of a sudden, everyone could be a publisher of information. So if Web 1 democratized access to information, Web 2 democratized access to publishing, to be able to you know, be your own publisher of information. And that's also a very positive thing, but it came with some steep downsides. Um, all of the value in Web 2 pretty much accrued to a handful of very powerful platforms. Those platforms uh, ran basically on advertising revenue. And so basically used recommendation engines as a way to push people um, into self-reinforcing echo chambers that, in my view, created social and political problems. They also became monopolies which stifled innovation. You know, if you consider like the, um, the, the world of uh, operating systems, for example, we basically have a duopoly where every single developer needs to pay the toll and many are deplatformed, um, you know, uh, for, for many different reasons. So Web2 had its disadvantages. And I think in a lot of ways, you could argue that it, that the, it, the web failed to live up to its potential during this first era of the web. So now the web and with it, the internet are entering a new era known as web three. So now the web is not just a way to read information or to publish information, but it is a way to own value. It's a way to own the asset class of the digital age, to be able to own our own data, own our own identities, to be able to own our own digital creations to be able to own our own assets um, online, to have digital property rights to money and other financial goods. That is something that has never happened before. And it's going to add a new economic layer to the web that I think is going to be transformational for business culture and society. So a lot of people ask me about what has crypto got to do with Web3? Well, I mean, in a way, in a sense, kind of a lot. Uh, but I think the term cryptocurrency is a bit of a misnomer because the term currency describes um, you know, something that's very specific, a medium of exchange, a store of value, a unit of account. Most tokens are not trying to be currencies. They're trying to be something else. Um, and so I think the best way to think about tokens is not as money or something like it, but rather as simply containers for value. So in the same way that a shipping container can contain, you know, car parts and food and, you know, um, computers and furniture and like basically anything you can kind of fit into a container, a token can be a container 
for value. It can be programmed to represent anything of value, money, financial assets, art, collectibles, titles, deeds, IP, votes, you name it. Another way to think about this is websites as being containers for information. And, you know, a website in the 1990s, I think people ask, like, well, what can you do with a website? Well, you can, you know, it can be a magazine and it can be, you know, where you get the news and it can be classifieds and it can be, you know, mapping data. And anyway, so a lot of things that I think were kind of skeuomorphic in their design, meaning based on ideas we had before. And I think today, a lot of the token designs are, are somewhat similar. And I would argue that right now, most tokens fit into one of 11 categories, but in a, in a matter of a couple of years, this kind of taxonomy is, is not gonna be very useful, or at least I, I hope it's not very useful because I think that you know we are going to find that tokens like websites can be programmed to do anything. And so the idea that they'll fit into one of 11 categories, I think will, will seem a little bit silly, but even still in my new book, um, this is how we break it down. So where do tokens fit into the history of assets in general? Well, assets are becoming both more democratized and more abstracted over time. So in feudal times, in the Middle Ages, the most important asset in the economy was land. And the most powerful people were those people who owned that land. And that wealth was concentrated in the hands of very few people. So the Doomsday Book, which cataloged the distribution of wealth in, in Norman England in 1066, showed that the church owned about a quarter of the land, the king owned about another quarter of the land, and the other half was owned by a handful of wealthy families. The vast majority of people in that time period didn't really have ownership um, in any meaningful sense of the word. The Industrial Revolution changed that quite materially. And what happened was that um, aristocratic landowners were replaced by industrial capitalists and capitalists built companies who had shareholders. And those shareholders were still mostly really rich people, but could include uh, you know, an emerging middle class. All of a sudden it was easier for people to own capital assets, to be able to make investments into things that created value, unlocked value. And so money and assets became slowly more uh, democratized, but they also became more abstracted. You know, land is something very tangible. It's, it's dirt. You can feel it in your hands. It's the thing that, you know, food comes from. Um, when it came to industrialization in the 19th and 20th century, you know, the most important asset class are, are legal abstractions. You know, they're things like stocks, um, you know, joint stock companies, share, you know, shares in a, in a, in a legal entity, um, bonds, you know, uh, contracts that entitle you to a flow of cash flow, you know, in the repayment of principal. Um, all of these things are, are kind of not tangible. <laughs> they're, they're fabrications, but they're the things that where all the wealth was driven in that period of time. So in the 19th century, you know, Cornelius Vanderbilt, the richest man um, who has lived in the last sort of 200 years, um, if every dollar that he owned was liquidated, it, he would uh, have taken about one dollar out of every 11 out of circulation, which is a lot more than today. You know, today, if Elon Musk sold every asset he had, he would take one out of 200 dollars out of circulation. And so you can see things are getting more democratized in feudal times. You know, the king owned a quarter of all the wealth. Right. And so now we're entering this new period where um, ownership is becoming more democratized. So about two thirds of Americans own shares in companies or mutual funds, which would have been unheard of in uh, you know, Vanderbilt's day. But also we have a new way of sort of capturing and representing value. I think the problem is that the, the joint stock company was the killer app for industrialization. And it was the way in which we were able to, you know, raise capital and organize capability. But now we've got a new way to do that for a digital economy. So it makes sense that for a digital economy, we should have a digital medium for value and a way to capture um, the economic upside of what we do on the internet. And I think that tokens are the way that we're going to do that. Another thing that's interesting is that tokens are programmable. They're intelligence, uh, intelligent. They can be made smart. Smart contracts are basically software that can automate complex business processes. They are software with a bank account, you know, that can pay people and organize and move value. And that's something that's going to have really profound implications. DAOs, new kinds of organizations that enable um, token holders rather than shareholders all around the world to coordinate uh, across borders and across time zones to build something of value online. And I think DAOs are really interesting for a lot of reasons, but the biggest one is that if you wanna create a 
new kind of network that is user owned, right? Um, and you want to empower people um, to contribute to this network. And the more they contribute, the more they own. You simply would not have been able to do that with a traditional company. With a traditional company, you would have had to uh, figure out how to do options agreements in 50 different countries and a dozen different languages. It just would have been prohibitively uh, expensive and complex to do that. But now we can with tokens. You know, you're contributing, you can earn a token reward, it goes right to your digital wallet, and you can become an owner of a network. And there are lots of examples of that in Web3. Lots of industries are going to be impacted by this as well. Financial services, which, you know, today um, is kind of a Rube Goldberg machine of complex processes, uh, many of them unnecessary. And in the end, sort of, we solve simple problems like, you know, we move value between, you know, customers and merchants, or we help people purchase and sell securities and so on and so forth. I mean, all of those different functions seem simple, but they involve a dozen different intermediaries. And uh, in the end, you know, it doesn't, uh, come without costs and it doesn't come without friction. So what I find is that a lot of innovation in, say, financial services, um, what they call fintech, is really nothing more than digital wallpaper. It's a sort of sleek user interface that makes interacting with the world of finance uh, a little bit nicer, a little friendlier, a little more fun. But in the end, it doesn't actually change the deep architecture of the industry. Uh, you're still interacting with banks, brokers, clearinghouses, custodians, transfer agents, you know, payment processors, all these old traditional entities. So what's interesting to me about Web3 and Web3's financial frontier is known as DeFi, is that it's trying to reimagine finance from the ground up. What does the industry actually do? So one of uh, Canada's most um, prominent bankers once told me that um, he said, you know, our business is not that complex, that we move money. And because we move money, we get to store money. And because we store money, we get to lend money. And lending is like our whole business, <laughs> pretty much. So, you know, you think that these are uh, institutions that are on such firm footing. But he said, you know, you, you move one thing around and all of a sudden it starts to be a bit more of a shaky platform. And so what we're seeing in DeFi are uh, innovators who are reimagining financial services from the ground up in all nine of these different areas. How we store money, how we move money, how we access credit, how we fund entrepreneurship, how we exchange value, how we insure against risk, how we organize information, how we do identity and so forth. And to me, that's something that's going to happen in every single industry. One final point on the blockchain story, which is that the role of the individual online, I think is about to change in a very important and meaningful way. So the old way of doing things is that you, as the user, create all this data and all this information, and you don't get to own or control it. It's owned and controlled by a bunch of different companies that you interact with. And in exchange, they give you some services. So in a way, you know, this is a form of digital feudalism, where we're not surfing the internet, we're surfing the internet, S-E-R-F. Get it? I'm a, I, I'm a dad, I just had two kids, so I'm allowed to make dad jokes now. But the, uh, <laughs> but the future, I think, is gonna be something very different where individual users have more sovereignty over their digital self, more sovereignty over their identity and their data. And, you know, this is all via a new kind of um, uh, tool called a wallet. And kind of like, you know, our existing wallet, it can contain financial assets, you know, money. It can contain uh, parts of our identity and data. It can give us uh, the accreditation we need to access services. You know, I'm Canadian. I have a thing called a health card in my wallet where I can walk into any hospital in Canada and get free healthcare. Um, it's got ways for us to access and unlock financial services, you know, credit card, bank card, and so forth. So we are just recreating something like that for the digital realm, where individuals can custody and control um, parts of their identity and use that as a way to unlock services. And I think that's a much better model. The second technology of Web3 and of this new age is artificial intelligence. So Alan Turing, um, is a, often considered sort of the, the father, the godfather of computing. Uh, among other things, he was able to build a computer to break the codes of the Nazi Enigma machine and help to win the war. And Alan Turing, you know, from a very, very um, early stage in his career, was fascinated by the concept of artificial intelligence. He developed this thing called the Turing test, which was supposed to figure out basically or determine 
whether or not um, a computer could feel uh, could fool a person into thinking that it was also a person. And this was supposed to be a sign of artificial generalized intelligence. Now, the question is, um, well, so I should say, uh, so what's interesting about that, among other things, is that the, the history of, of computing and cryptography, um, cryptography, which is foundational to blockchains, and AI have been um, interconnected um, all the way back since the very beginning, which I think is very interesting. Now, um, AI is an overnight success story that's frankly many decades in the making. In the 1960s, there were a lot of uh, computer scientists who were saying that you know, AI was going to uh, replace all knowledge work in a matter of decades. And of course, when the 80s came around, that hadn't happened. And so AI has had its fits and starts. But I think it's hit a key inflection point in the last year or so. Now, the companies that have been most successful so far are the ones who have developed the best large language models, but also the ones with the most data, you know, the most information they can feed into those models. And it makes sense that those should be Web2 companies because because Web2 companies have been engaged in this you know, Faustian bargain with us where we share all our data and get access to free services. So they're already sitting on all this information. And so they can train these models with like these reams and reams of data. But in my view, the future of AI is not going to be siloed in the hands of large companies, and it's not going to be closed off from the world. It's going to be distributed and it's going to be open source because all of the information in the future is going to be, I think, custody or controlled by people and by businesses and not necessarily um, in uh, the hands of large platforms. And even today, there's more data outside of the platforms than there is inside of the platforms. So we need a way to be able to connect that data into a data commons and to run that into open source uh, large language models. And I think that's something that's only really possible at the convergence of blockchain and AI. I'll give you an example of this in practice. So um, the history of culture and art is an interesting one as it relates to technology. So in pre-industrial times, if you're a creator, you had to rely on a wealthy patron, you know, the Medici's, the Church of, uh, of England, uh, you know, the, uh, the Catholic Church, something like that, um, the, the Habsburgs. <laughs> um, and, you know, as a creator, oftentimes your creation reflected their objectives and desires. The industrial era changed that. It gave people a way to sell to the mass market. So you could sell a, you know, a paperback novel to a growing literate class. You could sell uh, a lithograph to you know, a bunch of people who could afford it. You could later on sell a record or a CD to you know, millions of people and collect a small amount for every sale and end up doing pretty well for yourself. So in a way, the 20th century was kind of like a golden age for creators. Now, the first era of the web um, was supposed to actually make this even better for creators because it was going to disintermediate stores and other middlemen. And people were able, going to be able to sell directly to their fans. Um, but what ended up happening was something very different. Um, Art and culture, which used to be um, an asset, became a commodity. You know, it's something you could just get, you know, reprinted over and over again with the web through file sharing to the point where the value became close to zero. So we got the unbundling of music into individual songs through Apple. And then later streaming platforms came in. And the upshot today is that creators know a lot less about how their art is being consumed. And on average, they're getting paid less too. And so in a way, you know, the first era of the web actually seems to have been kind of not great for creators. And now you add AI to the mix. You know, AI, maybe it, maybe it makes um, creators out of all of us and, you know, the, the, the market for art grows. I, I don't know. I think what's more likely is that, you know, we use AI to write scripts and write scores to film and TV, and we use it to create visual effects, and maybe we even use digital twins to, you know, have actors in film and TV. And uh, in the end, the human creator maybe gets paid once for their likeness or, uh, you know, gets um, paid to come in and polish a script and add a little human element to it. But otherwise, you know, there's no IP owned by individuals. Now, I should say that there are regulatory and, and um, other solutions to this problem. In Hollywood right now, the writers and, and the actors are, are trying to have bargained a deal where a lot of that stuff will improve. But I think that technology can be part of the solution. So we know this from the world of Web3, that artists can get paid for their digital creations, including their sort of digital IP, and that they can get paid again if it gets sold, resold, or used in some other way. So in the world of NFTs, um, there are 300 projects that have generated at least $1 million of secondary revenue from resale. So, you know, you sell a digital 
um, artwork and um, it sells for a thousand dollars and then it sells for five thousand dollars you can get paid a royalty on the five thousand dollar sale that's something that doesn't exist in traditional mediums right like if you're a starving artist and you sell a piece for a thousand bucks and it sells later for a hundred grand you typically don't get paid again so that's something that we can do with nfts and something we can do with ip so your script or your comedy um special or your art gets fed into a large language model and produces something of value that someone pays for you should get paid for it too and we can use digital assets and smart contracts to do that another area of ai and um, web3 is the DeSci landscape so i mentioned that data won't be siloed it will be distributed well think about clinical trial data for example you know, we need to um, marshal all the resources that we can in order to feed into, you know, clinical trials and, and other scientific studies to try and, you know, yield some positive outcomes. How can we do that? I think the only way to do that is by creating, you know, anonymized, um, vetted uh, sources of data where the provenance is known and where the creator can get compensated. Uh, AI and education. You know, I have two kids, um, one and a half and four and a half. I'm pretty sure that my one and a half year old is going to have a lifelong companion. And that companion is going to be a friend, a confidant, um, maybe a tutor, uh, a teacher, a life coach, a career advisor. And that companion is not gonna be a person. That companion is gonna be AI. And I don't know if I, how I feel about that, but I just feel like it's an inevitability. But what I do know is that I would really like to know what that AI is trained on, what kind of data is going into that large language models, model? How do I know that it's accurate? How do I know that it's not going to create negative outcomes for my kids? Again, I think the only way to do that is through the combination of AI and blockchain. The third technology is extended reality. So the first era of the web, web one, was two-dimensional. You know, you log on to a web browser and you uh, interact with a website. Web two was two and a half dimensional, where you're still on a flat screen, but you're integrated into the world. You know, you call an Uber, um, for, you know, using the Uber app, like it is connected into the environment. So I think that Web three promises a new interface for the web. Um, the first one is wallets, so a way to control the assets. But the other one is how we experience the web virtually. And I think that it, at some point, extended reality will become part of our future. So there's a question around this and the metaverse. What does this mean for um, you know, the metaverse, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm not sure what your definition is for the metaverse. For me, I think of it as a, a new shared reality for humanity online. Um, and I think that a lot of people think of it as virtual reality from Facebook or Apple or something. And I, and I don't think that's what it is, you know? I mean, I think if you're going online into a virtual world controlled by a big company where they set the rules, they own the data, um, they decide whether you have rights to your assets and how you can use and sell them and so forth. Um, and in the end, you can't take them with you. Like that's not, that's not uh, a new shared uh, reality for humanity. That is just Dis Disneyland online, right? That's just virtual uh, theme park. And that's okay. Um, you know, theme parks are fun. Disneyland is, is lots of fun. Um, but it's not like a new sort of plane of reality. Um, so I think in order to fulfill the vision of a web three metaverse, we need three things. Number one, we need to have a reasonable right to privacy. This is something that is enshrined in law in the real world. And I think it should extend to the virtual world as well. We need digital property rights. If you buy an asset, you should own it. Right now, people spend tens of billions of dollars buying virtual goods and video games and other online environments, but without actual clear property rights. Like they can't resell it. They don't participate in the upside or the downside. Um, they just are beholden to the rules of the, the game environment. And I think if we're going to really create a new shared reality, we need digital property rights. And the third is economic freedom. You need to be able to do whatever you want with your assets within the law, right? Um, if you want to take them outside of one environment and bring them to another, if you want to sell them, if you want to you know, trade them with someone, you should be able to do that peer to peer without the need to um, pay a fee or with risk of being shut down by the you know, game environment. So there are lots of challenges to making this a reality. There are no common standards yet around the metaverse. There's a group called the Open Metaverse Association, OMA3, which is doing some interesting work in this space. We need interoperability across platforms, um, not just across blockchains and other networks, but across companies and, and game environments. 
Um, I think that there are, are still risks of Web2 uh, models being applied to ownership. Um, and I think that's something we need to worry about too. And there are lots of other sort of technical, social, economic, and computing and infrastructure demands that we need to meet. And I think that's a good segue into number four. So we have to, I'm trying to paint a picture here of a world where there are, you know, countless billions of um, people, new organizations, smart contracts, uh, companies, and connected devices that all need a way to transact, to establish trust, and to prove their identity, and to be able to do all that peer-to-peer -peer, um, instantly and frictionlessly. So like, that's the opportunity. Um, how are we going to get there exactly? It's not going to be through legacy um, infrastructure, I don't believe, or through existing financial intermediaries or even existing tech platforms. I think that the internet of everything needs a ledger of everything. We need a new platform, a new operating system for this digital age, and we need to marshal all the resources that we have to make that happen. So that takes me to the final category of the remarks here, which is around physical infrastructure. So there's an emerging field within Web3 known as decentralized physical infrastructure that basically posits that you can use token incentives to coordinate people and businesses across geographies to pool physical resources together and to build the net build networks that can rival traditional kinds of companies. And those kinds of networks can be everything from cloud networks to wireless networks to sensor networks, to energy networks. They can even include things like mapping data and other things that normally we think of as the reserve of large corporations can be done by individuals. So collectively, this world of DPIN, decentralized physical infrastructure, includes dozens and dozens of organizations that are all doing really, really interesting work. So why do we need decentralized physical infrastructure? Well, in a way, one is to fulfill the web's promise. Um, you know, the, the web is supposed to be a decentralized network of information. And I think through Web3, a decentralized network for value. But if you know the uh, protocols are running through large intermediaries that control everything, whether it's you know internet service providers, cloud providers, et cetera, then there are points of failure. And that's a problem from a cybersecurity perspective. It's a problem from a sort of censorship resistant perspective. You know, the web is supposed to be permissionless for people. It's supposed to be a public open protocol. And if we have too many uh, choke points, then that becomes a huge problem. So by building decentralized physical infrastructure, we can overcome those choke points. Number two is enhanced performance. You know, the, 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 the picture that I'm painting is one where we've got trillions of dollars of value um, trading hands on blockchain networks. We've got large language models powering all sorts of knowledge work and creative work and so forth. And we have a metaverse, a, a, a shared reality online that will, in order to be fun and realistic and useful, require vast amounts of computing power and other resources, connectivity and so forth. Right now, we don't have the resources to actually make that a reality. So we actually need to harness all these other assets in order to enhance the performance of the web, in order to fulfill its promise. And then the final thing is that it's good to have choice um, if you're a business or as an individual. You know, it's just not fun when we have monopolies in every industry and having other ways to, you know, provide alternatives is going to make everything more competitive and, and more efficient. So where are we on the S-curve? Well, my view is that all four of these technologies are hitting an inflection point at basically the exact same time. And, you know, uh, from the outside looking in, technology innovation can sometimes feel like an overnight success story, when in reality, it's decades in the making. Ironically, blockchain is the one where people are always like, you know, well, when's it going to happen? Blockchains have only been around for uh, 12 years, you know, 13 years, really. Um, and in that period of time, I've created a market of one and a half trillion dollars of value that um, an asset class that's, you know, held and used by by hundreds of millions of people. So I find that critique uh, interesting when you compare it and contrast it to, you know, say virtual reality or to AI, both of which have, you know, first came into existence in the 60s, but have yet, but are just now hitting their stride. So I think if you look at the S curve for innovation, you know, time passes <clears throat> in the early days and there's not that much growth because there's a lot of R&D and, and so forth. 
And then all of a sudden you hit an inflection point where for every unit of time, you get much more growth and economic output. And then things slow down. And I think right now Web3 is right at that turning point for um, the S-curve. So I often get asked like, you know, is this just going to be US dominating all over again? Well, in Web1 and, and Web2, Silicon Valley was once called a tech Galapagos um, because of the unique sort of blend of, of talent and capital and R&D and universities and government support and, you know, uh, institutions that really led to the creation of the first web that led to the unique species of companies, right, um, that can only exist there and nowhere else. And this time, just very different. Uh, technology, tools, capital, capabilities, all more distributed than ever. And these tools help to distribute it further. I actually think that in a way, you know, the world of Web3 is getting flatter. If Web1 um, democratized access to information and Web2 democratized access to publishing, then Web3 empowers people with an even more potent toolkit, you know, a way to move and store value, to, to coordinate value, to, to gain employment, to build wealth in a globally distributed way. So if technology really makes the world flatter, I think Web3 is going to be a steamroller. But it's also a new frontier. And the book is called Web3, Charting the Internet's Next Economic and Cultural Frontier. And I strongly encourage all of you to, to check it out, because if, you, if you've selected self-selected to join this call, then you're someone who wants to understand the future um, and maybe, who knows, play a role in, in shaping it. So most frontiers in, um, in human history are not pushed by big companies or armies or um, you know wealthy people. They're typically pushed by everyday people, uh, people who are driven by, by circumstances or by a great idea or by you know the search for something new and different. Um, and you know that's something that I think will be true here as well. You know, I think Web3, the frontier is not being pushed always by governments and by big companies, though we are seeing many of them embrace this technology. Um, it's being pushed by, you know, scrappy upstarts, entrepreneurs, um, and individuals like uh, like you and me. So um, every frontier has its fair share of opportunity, and every frontier has got its fair share of, of risks and pitfalls, too. And I think even the, the you know, the hardiest of explorers needs a guide. And my hope is that my new book is going to be the field guide of sorts for the web's next uh, economic and cultural frontier. So I hope you check it out. And thank you very much. And that was 42 minutes, perfect timing. And I'd love to answer any questions that anybody has. So Alex, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. So first of all, a great presentation. Loved how you incorporated the full sweep of history and all of the context about where we are. Wonderful. Um, so I, I, what I was struck by as you went through some of the different aspects of Web3 was how this need for a secure decentralized identity was somewhere down underneath as the plumbing, right? You can't have ownership. You can't have contract creators getting rewarded. Uh, you can't check the content of your large language model building. Uh, you can't have uh, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, unless you have uh, or, or secure supply chains or any of these other things without a uh, uh, the provenance and at some level down there in the plumbing, a secure identity. Can you comment a little bit more on that? Do I have that right? Um, and uh, if I if I if I do, as you know, we're we're trying within Moby to build uh, the the and and our affiliated consortiums, MEF and AIS, to build the integrated trust network, which is a decentralized uh, uh, identity registry. Can you comment yeah. a little bit more on that aspect of of things? Well, I know the integrated trust network, and I think what you guys are doing is really really interesting. Um, and there are lots of different. Um, you know, challenges that, that need to be overcome in order to fulfill this vision of, of Web3 and identity. And again, it, it, I think it speaks really to the convergence of these different technologies. One of the biggest concerns that I see is the question of humanness itself. You know, how do we prove our humanness in a world where AI can fool people into thinking that it's people online? I just think that the attack vectors for you know AI-based scams and other sort of phishing attempts um, is just far too great. 
um, to be ignored. And so there's a, there's a several dimensions to this, which is we need a way for individuals to be able to secure their own assets and their own data um, so that they participate more in the upside um, of the their creations online and they have more privacy. But we also need a way for them to prove um, their, their humanness so that um, they can unlock, you know, um, services online and also not fall victim to scams themselves. And so I think that um, we need to consider all of those different design parameters when designing an ID. You know, right now, just candidly, like it's 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 powerful, but it's still pretty simple. So like if you have like a MetaMask wallet, for example, in the Ethereum um, blockchain, you know, you can store in that um, your assets, you can store credentials, um, NFTs and tokens that might help you to unlock communities, right? So in a way that's like a form of authentication and verification and sort of in a way it's almost, you know, bootstrapped uh, digital identity online. And, you know, you could even include things like your credit score uh, or your on chain sort of personality in terms of what kind of, what kind of behavior you engage in DeFi and others. So we are bootstrapping these identity systems sort of through the existing primitives like wallets, like MetaMask. But I think that we need to, you know, think thoughtful, like to, to, to be really thoughtful about how to actually do that. I mean, the integrated uh, trust network, you know, to me is is interesting um, for a lot of reasons. One is that it has the buy-in of, of some, you know, companies. And I think that in order to make this successful, you need to have everybody at the table. And um, I think that there's probably lots of room for different kinds of systems to, to develop for sure. Hi, Alex. Hi. Hi, I'm Vinayak. I'm a PhD student at Imperial, and uh, I'm working on like uh, self-sovereign identities in battery passport application. So how do you see Web3 helping sustainability sector? Helping the sustainability sector? Um, well, one of the interesting things that I've seen is around um, carbon, carbon offsets and, and the carbon markets. You know, and figuring out a way to basically uh, reward people for reducing their footprint. Um, there's a lot of different applications in Web3 where you can play to earn or, you know, learn to earn, um, where, you know, there's sort of a, a clear incentive there. Um, play to earn is, you know, games need, uh, you know, players. And so the more you like to, to have network effects, so the more players in the game, you know, um, the more useful it is. So people who play a lot should get compensated. Um, learn to earn would be, you know, um, we need to train people as the developers and we need a way to prove that they've gotten the credentials. Well, we're going to sort of incentivize them to learn. And by getting those credentials, we're going to improve our labor pool. Um, and I think of like a lot of the, um, the walk to earn and the other sort of like move to earn plays as being something that could affect the environment. I'd love to like understand a bit better, you know, how we might integrate that with tokenized carbon offsets, whereby, you know, people for sort of um, moving to earn could actually offset their carbon footprint um, and, you know, end up getting paid, um, either paid in some native token or get compensated by the government. And it could be a way even to offset carbon taxes um, in countries like Canada where, where they've been implemented. So I always thought that was a very interesting idea. Um, I also think the idea of um, using these technologies as a way to sort of prove um, compliance with ESG without giving away trade secrets is a really tough one. So, you know, under ESG rules, you've got to be able to prove not only how much carbon your company creates, but also how much carbon your supply chain creates. The only problem is people's supply chains are like tightly guarded secrets. And so you can't like prove it without revealing information about who's in your supply chain. So there's some interesting projects where people are using like zero knowledge proofs to basically prove that, that the participants in the supply chain are meeting the ESG requirements of the company without having to give away any, um, you know, proprietary secrets about the business. So that's another one that I think is kind of interesting too. Yeah, thank you. So uh, Alex, uh, thank you, uh, enjoyed the presentation. A question for you around uh, government regulation um, and the risk around government regulation, whether it be you know, uh, national security, whether it be, you know, regulatory for all the reasons, commerce, trade, uh, environmental, and then obviously the big one being taxation, right? Uh, 
who who collects taxation, where in all this value stream, and how does it get uh, administered? So, I'd like to understand the risk and also how you see you know regulatory uh, aspects coming into Web three being managed. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that Web three needs regulation. Um, all all industry needs regulation, especially if you're a big business and you're looking to invest into the new technology. You're not going to do it unless you got a clear understanding of what the rules of the road are. And what I find interesting about Web3 is that in a way, it's very different from prior eras of the web. You know, in Web1 and Web2, um, we had regulatory tailwinds. And in Web3, I think we have regulatory headwinds. And a lot of that has to do with the uncertainty and lack of clarity around digital assets. You know, what are these assets? You know, all these new um, tokens that represent value of some kind, are they all meant to be securities? And if they're all meant to be securities, should they be regulated by securities regulators? Or are they something different, or at least are some of them something different? And should we come up with a new regime in order to, to manage and sort of govern them? And I think that's the central issue, frankly, right now. Um, in terms of, you know, things like taxation, it's like, you know, I don't see how we can't apply, apply existing taxation laws to, to um, this technology. And in terms of national security, you know, my, my, my thinking is the bigger risk from a national security perspective is that the U.S. allows this all to develop offshore rather than bringing it into the fold. Um, I'm writing an op-ed right now, actually, for, for Coindesk, where I talk about Web3 uh, nimbyism and, and Web3 yimbyism, you know, like not in my backyard, yes, in my backyard. And the idea being, being basically, you know, the Biden administration is so interested in onshoring uh, jobs and legacy industries, but so far at least seems to be interested in offshoring um, jobs and opportunity in new industries like Web3. And so I think that there's an opportunity to to reconcile those two uh, perspectives. You know, if we're trying to make um, America, um, and I'm Canadian, but, you know, I want the U.S. to be successful. Um, you know, if, if you want America to be a global leader in finance and technology, which has historically been its sort of prerogative, then you need to create the conditions for industry to succeed. And I think that right now there's a sort of growing uneasiness <clears throat> about technology in general. I think that people worry that, you know, it's going to destroy jobs or it's going to embolden criminals or it's going to lead to hate speech or it's going to harm our children. And like all things, there's certainly truth to all of that. But in the aggregate, it's a positive and it needs to be supported. So under the uh, regulatory view, would you see it more as a regionalized kind of like a, for lack of better definition, like a NAFTA approach, a EU versus kind of a global agreement around, you know, the regulations, the controls and potentially ultimate tax. Well, I would love an, I would love a NAFTA. I mean, right now, the problem is that within the U.S., you've got a half a dozen regulators that all have different perspectives on the same issue. So we haven't you haven't we haven't even sorted it out within each individual country. Um, so like that's step one, <laughs> you know, like right now you've got different states in the U.S. coming up with the regulatory um, licensing regimes that are different from one another. And I think that's problematic. Like you need to have, to your point, some kind of, you know, regional consensus to to, to achieve scale in, the, in these areas. Okay, thank you. Any others? It's okay if there aren't. You can always uh, find out more by buying my book. <laughs> and I would encourage you to purchase it in massive volume for everyone who's listening, for yourself, your friends, your colleagues, your mom, your dad, your children. I think everybody needs a copy. So since no one's talking, I'm just going to fill the airspace. Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll second that by yeah. a dozen. Uh, um, so so I, I wanted to give a, a little bit of context on the earlier question about the circular economy. So um, we, we have a, a a circular economy working group that we just launched um, with a couple of large company co-chairs. Um, they're doing a, a couple of, of uh, use cases, um, including a uh, battery passport uh, for to comply with EU and US regulations and uh, and also um, to, to do the uh, the ESG supply chain. So it sort of hits on all three of the the things that you mentioned, the ESG compliance, the uh, the uh, need for 
um, secure supply chains done under zero knowledge proofs, not reduced, not revealing any proprietary information. Um, and uh, we also did a, a carbon accounting um, pilot with the, uh, uh, the European Commission a, a year or two ago. So um, I touched on a lot of those issues that you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. I'll put in our own plug here. Anybody on, uh, on seeing the call who wants to uh, get involved or anybody, Alex, that you run into who wants to get involved in some of those uh, ESG issues, welcome to come in and uh, join the Circular Economy Working Group. Yeah, terrific. Well, thanks everyone for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I've got to jump, jump to another presentation in five minutes. Um, so this will give me time to get a glass of water <laughs> in between sessions. So I appreciate that. Um, but Chris, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, everyone, please, if you'd like to learn more, check out the book, check out web3booktour.com for a, a location uh, of an event in your town. And uh, yeah, check out the book for yourself. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Thank you very much, Alex. That was great. Thank you. Take care. Bye.